Welcome back, friends and listeners, to your favorite true crime podcast, Truth, Lies, and Alibis, by two 911 dispatchers. Episode 15, The Unacceptable Truth. This week, Brittany tells me about the still unsolved disappearance of six-year-old Morgan Nick. Hey Jess, how are you? Good. I just want to say before we start that because of my love for children and I had so many and I work with them, I am sick. So my voice might sound a little oh. rough this episode. Yeah, and I babysat two of her children for <laughs> like an hour and a half and got their kid germs. So I also sound sick. That's the world we live in. It is. <laughs> so it might be a little rough, but we're here. So, But we're here and we're carrying on. But tell me your interesting (laughs) fact of the the episode. Okay. This one is, I I chose this one particularly because of our affinity for naps. Mm -hmm. We all like to nap. Did you know that snails, when they take naps, a single nap (laughs) can last up to three years? Three years? Three years for a single nap. I thought you were going to say three days. No. (laughs) No. No, three calendar years. Do they even live that long? I apparently long enough to nap for that long. Jesus. Speaking of snails, have you ever had escargot? Isn't that what that is? That is what that is, but I've never had it. No. It tastes like weird chewy pepperoni. I don't recommend it. I'm weird about certain textures, so I don't know if... If you'd like it. If I'd like it, yeah. I'm thinking I'm you okay probably wouldn't. I'm okay with like wouldn't. certain sushis and stuff like that, but other textures, like scallops, mm-hmm. I can't do the texture of scallops. They're not great, no. <laughs> and I feel like scallops sometimes taste fishier than fish. I won't ever make scallops for you like I'd be eating them anyway. <laughs> All right. Are we ready for some horrible sadness? It just gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> Our tagline. Let's get into it. All right. So today's story takes place in Alma, Arkansas. Alma, Arkansas is located at the edge of the Ozark Mountains. Its population is about 5,850 people. That's not a lot. No, it's like very small town. On June 9th, 1995, a red truck with a box-like body and a camper attached made its way through the town. The driver of the truck pulled up next to a teenage girl walking down the road and asked her if she wanted a ride. The girl said no and ran away. Not long after that, two girls, ages five and six, were outside playing in their front yard when they ran inside to one of their mothers, terrified. They told her about a red truck with a white camper. Mm -hmm. Then, some teenage boys who are walking from a baseball field when the driver of the red truck yells at them and tells them to get out of the road before turning down Walnut Street. The street used to get to Walford, I think it's Wolford, baseball field, where some 10-year-old boys saw the truck at the baseball field between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. The truck was then seen in the upper baseball field parking area before disappearing around 10.40 p.m. At the baseball field is Colleen Nick. She's a single mom who runs an in-home daycare, and earlier that evening, after all the children she babysat for had left, she gave her children, 6-year-old Morgan, four-year-old Logan, and 22-month-old Taryn a bath after feeding them some grilled cheese. She then packs them up and drops Taryn and Logan off at her parents' house, and her and Morgan go to Wofford Baseball Field to see a family friend's child play baseball. The baseball field is just a block from Alma PD. There are dirt parking lots near the field, but nothing else. There's no bathrooms or concession stands. They pull into the dirt lots around 9 p.m. and join their friends in the bleachers, which, question, why is there a baseball game for children at 9 o'clock p.m.? That seems really late. Like, maybe because of the heat? I don't know, because it's summer? But also, that sounds miserable. Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't the beginning of the game. Maybe it just went on for a long time. Oh, it was the beginning of this game because it lasted until, like, 1040. Yeah. I was like, I love my children so much. I would not want to go see them play baseball at 9 p.m. I definitely wouldn't want to see, sorry people, anybody else's kids play baseball at 9 p.m. And I like to be at home in my pajamas by then. I mean, maybe I'm like an old lady, but like, I'd rather be at home. Uh, yeah. Anyway, for an hour and a half, Morgan sits in the stands with her mom watching the game. Every now and then, two kids, Ty and Jessica, come up and ask Morgan to play with them. And for a while, she says she doesn't want to. Colleen describes her as a little shy, and instead she sits with her mom and, like, jokes with her. She keeps untying her shoes, and her mom pretends to be surprised. 
But then the two kids come back up to her when the game is getting close to ending and ask her to come chase fireflies with them, and Morgan wants to go. At first, Colleen, who is thought to be an overprotective mother, tells Morgan no. She's worried that it's too dark and late, but her friends tell her that it's safe area and the kids all play together, so she lets Morgan go. Morgan gives her mom a huge hug, kisses her on the cheek, and then runs off with a huge smile on her face to chase fireflies with her friends. Six-year-old Morgan is wearing a greenish-blue Girl Scout shirt, denim shorts, and white tennis shoes. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. She's four feet tall and weighed 55 pounds. This was the last time Colleen would hug Morgan. Colleen looked out for the kids running and playing and checked on them three to four times, and the baseball game ends. Ty and Jessica return to the bleachers without Morgan. They tell Colleen that she had been playing with them in a sand pile near the parking area, and Morgan had to sit down to tie her shoes. Ty had waited for her and then turned and ran towards the fields when she got up, and by the time he got there, Morgan was no longer following him. Mm. This all occurred two to three minutes prior to him talking to Colleen. Colleen's worried, so she goes to her car to see if maybe Morgan is waiting in or near the vehicle. When she gets to her parked Nissan, she looks all around the vehicle and inside, but Morgan is nowhere to be found. One of the coaches saw her searching frantically for Morgan, and he calls 911, and the parents at the field starts to help search for Morgan as well. When the police arrived, they began a grid search in the area, and the police at first thought Morgan had wandered off and got lost because she wasn't familiar with the baseball field, because they lived in a town a few minutes away and had traveled to come see the game. Okay. Ty and Jessica tell the police that a white male subject with a scruffy beard had been watching them. He wore shorts and was possibly wearing an open short or had no shirt on at all. He had a hairy chest and stomach and had been sitting in a red truck with a camper shell. The door had been opened and he was smoking a cigarette and they would later make a composite sketch with the police of the scruffy bearded man. At the time, they thought for sure this red truck was connected to the disappearance of Morgan. They still do. Alma Police Chief Jeff Pointer, who had begun his career in law enforcement as a dispatcher and worked his way to patrol, then to police chief, told the documentary series Still Missing Morgan, I think it happened very quickly. On his way out of the parking lot, I think he stepped out of the truck, grabbed her, put her in the truck, and took off. The last time the red truck was seen that night was when teenagers were driving near the Arkansas River and saw the truck pulled over. One of the teenagers thought at the time he had seen an older male subject holding down a girl in the front seat, possibly a little girl. They would tell detectives later who attempted to search the area, but at the time they got to the area, it had flooded. So Hmm. it sounded like the teenagers were out and they were drinking and smoking and doing stuff they probably shouldn't have been doing Yeah. yeah and so they didn't come forward with this information until later four days after morgan is taken police had discovered a home video that had been taken at the parking lot showing the red truck However, the angle was not great and there was no identifying information available on the tape. A television news station would later report that the truck had been proven to be owned by a parent whose child was on the field. However, in Still Missing Morgan, the detective states that this is not true. Detective Hartley says, I have not found a single document at this point that tells me the truck's cleared or that the owner of the truck has been identified. And the night that Morgan disappeared, the police had done the work of going through and getting all the information on everyone they could who was at the baseball field and what vehicle they owned. This red truck had been seen by many people. Some say that they saw it parked next to Colleen's vehicle that night. It's described as a Ford or a Chevy with, they said, a box style kind of frame. We know that the eyewitness accounts aren't always great. And speaking from the dispatch perspective, I've received many calls where a vehicle is described as one make and model. And then the next call comes in and it's a completely different make and model. Ain't that the truth? So you know how that goes. Memories are flawed. (laughs) Yes. So police had put in a lot of work from the beginning, right? They took it serious from the beginning. They did hard work. They also put in work that over the next few days, they stopped every vehicle they saw that matched the description. So every red truck, whether it had a camper or not, that was like boxy style, they stopped and spoke to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, what year was this? 1995. Okay. Yeah. Two months after Morgan's abduction in Van Buren, Arkansas, an 11-year-old girl calls the police from Sonic. She tells the police that she walked to Sonic with her brother and a friend where they got their food and sat behind the Sonic to eat. While they are sitting there, a male subject in a red truck pulls up next to the kids and offers the boys some money to talk to the girl alone. Yeah. He coaxes them to walk a few blocks away by giving them money and continues to try to get the girl alone. The boys refuse to leave her alone and the male subject then begins to make inappropriate sexual comments to her. He offered her money to go with him and she's terrified, rightfully so. She says no. She tells him she's going to call the police and the kids run back to Sonic and make that phone call. Yeah. 
The driver freaks out, takes off, and then crashes into a light pole. He attempts to leave the area, but a waitress who had witnessed the collision jotted down the license plate. Good. (laughs) Yeah. The license plate returns to Billy Jack Lynx. He was driving the red truck and was super intoxicated at the time of this incident. He was actually driving back from the liquor store when he saw the kids. The truck is found at his residence with front end damage, and he's arrested for sexual solicitation of a child. Through the witness and the front end damage and the paint on the pole and everything, they're able to link him to this crime. That's not the only thing he was charged with, though, right? No, that was it. What about fleeing the scene of an accident? I didn't see anything about that. It should be on there, too. But Or DUI. I don't know. But, I mean, we'll get to it. Billy Jack Lynx had a criminal history that just makes you sick to your stomach. In 1992, he was accused of molesting one of his own granddaughters. He was arrested and charged, but was only given 10 years of probation. Because of this, he was out in 1995, the time of Morgan's disappearance. If you could see Jessica's face right now, you would see anger, disappointment. Disappointment, right? Like, that's the big thing is there's this chance to put some, a predator away and keep them away from v- potential victims, and it doesn't happen. And so there's more victims and more people affected. Yeah, and the sad thing is it happens all the time. Oh, yeah. Every day. Side note, on top of April being Child Abuse Awareness Month, it's also Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So, I mean, this goes hand in, like, they're both there. So, yeah. Spread awareness, people. Also, there should be better laws. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Witnesses tell investigators that in 1995, he had poured a concrete slab in his property just three days after Morgan's abduction. Before they search the area, though, he agrees to take a polygraph test and passes, and somehow within the whole investigation, like, they search his property, but they don't search that area where the concrete is at that time. 25 years later, Detective Hartley and the FBI... 25 years? 25 years later, Detective Hartley and the FBI search the area but find nothing. So some other interesting details about Lynx. This incident occurred just eight weeks after Morgan was taken, And his red truck had a camper on it until right about the time when Morgan was abducted. Van Buren is just 10 minutes from Alma. September 1st, 1995, his truck is processed and then brought in for more detailed processing. There is a cutout in a seat that had blood on it that's taken. However, 25 years later, there's a report that this was taken, but the evidence cannot be found. His truck was impounded and remained in custody until it was sold at an auction. The investigators who are currently reinvestigating Morgan's kidnapping were able to track the truck down to its new owner, and there's clear evidence that a camper had been attached to the vehicle previously, so the holes had been filled in, but you could see that there was definitely a camper at one point. It's a red Chevy box-style truck. This matches the description that Jessica, Morgan's friend, had given the police. Fibers are collected from the truck that match the fibers of the blue-green Cotton Girl Scout shirt that Morgan had been wearing the night of her abduction. Wow. 25 years later, which is crazy. Yeah, that's crazy. The lab states, due to the variability in manufacturing, dyeing, and consumer use, one would not expect to encounter a fiber selected at random to be consistent with a particular item, meaning it is highly unlikely that it would match like a random material. So that's definitely yeah. probably the same shirt. Mm-hmm. If he is Morgan's killer, however, he will not face justice. He died on August 5th, 2000, at the age of 76 years old, while serving time for the 1995 conviction of sexual solicitation of a minor for the Sonic incident. So when this happened, he was 71. Wow. He is the only subject that they have publicly named as a person of interest in Morgan's case. Colleen says, I think the part that bothers me the most is that the perpetrator is deceased. At the end of the day, that means that there is no justice. No one has to stand and face us for what they did. Investigators, including the FBI and Detective Hartley, refuse to give up on Morgan's case. They are working to find definitive proof that Billy Jack Lynx abducted and murdered Morgan Nick. They also don't want to have tunnel vision, so they are working on other suspects. They ever find her body? They have never found her body. I think that's the saddest thing. So what do you think so far? About the subject that they named as a person of interest. I'm just curious. As one that has said before that I don't believe in coincidences, (laughs) uh, (laughs) it seems fairly likely that this sicko is responsible. Yeah. It just seems like there's too much. Evidence points to it. Yeah. There's too much that, like, is similar. There's too much. It's just too much. And then the green fibers. Yeah, that's pretty damning. So... 
Another of the subjects that they considered was Charlie Vines. He came up during the investigation because he was a convicted rapist and murderer. Detective Hartley put in the time to map out his victims in location at the time, and his known victims ranged from teenage girls to elderly women, and at the time of Morgan's abduction, he was free in the area and had been known to drive a red truck. However, investigators haven't been able to find evidence to prove he had a truck like that one at the time. So it sounds like they had some people who came forward and said, oh, he owned a red truck like this, but they can't find any like concrete evidence to show that he did. Mm -hmm. And Morgan really doesn't fit his 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 victim pool. He lived in Crawford County and investigators wondered if he could be involved in other cases, including Morgan's case. A jailhouse snitch even told investigators he had actually confessed to murdering her, and he said the best way to hide a body was to put it under concrete. But from everything I looked into and stuff, I didn't find anything about him pouring any concrete, just the other guy. Yeah, did they ever pull that concrete up? They searched the area 25 years later. he It's in the documentary. They go out there and search the area. They don't find anything. Like they, they dug it up, up that concrete and mm-hmm. huh. Yeah. I thought the same thing as you, like it doesn't match his MO and we'll get to it later, but he typically liked older women who were vulnerable yeah. and they, he had one teenage victim that they know of one and it was just kind of a crime of opportunity. Well, and it seems like too, that this, whoever the suspect was that day was going around the area targeting younger girls. Like, Morgan was just the only one he had the opportunity to abduct. Like, he had, he was trying all day. It seems like maybe he was trying to work up the courage, or he just was kind of waiting around, and he decided to take her because it was easy. Easy? Yeah, I believe that. Like, he was sitting there watching her, and maybe as soon as he saw that she was alone, he was like, this is it, this is my chance. Well, like, what better opportunity, if that's your victim pool, right, is a small, young female child, and there's a whole baseball game happening at night that's a child's baseball game, and you've got kids running around and playing, like, what better hunting ground are you going to find, you know? Yeah, which is sad and disturbing. It's disgusting? Yeah. When investigators in Morgan's case went to investigate Charlie Vines, however, he was in a coma-like state dying from cancer, so they were unable to talk to him about Morgan's case. Which I'm like, Hmm. I hope that was very painful for you. (laughs) And I'm wondering too, like, if his... If his admission to the cellmate or whoever he talked to in jail, like if it was just boasting or if he actually, like, I wonder how truthful that was as far as the, what the jailmate reported. I was going to say, I wonder if he even said it because right, jailhouse snitches, like, yeah, sometimes they can be trusted probably, but frequently it's so that they can get some kind of deal. They want something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they'll just make up anything to get what they want. Morgan's case has been on Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, and Hulu's Still Missing Morgan. Morgan's mother, Colleen, founded the Morgan Nick Foundation in 1996 and dedicates her life to helping other families with missing children in Arkansas. On the About page on the Morgan Nick Foundation website, the focus of the foundation falls into three categories. And this is a quote. Intervention provided for families of missing persons. MNF provides on-site support through trained search and rescue workers, prints and disseminates flyers of missing persons, creates social media campaigns, works as a liaison with law enforcement and media, coordinates local and national resources for the searching family, provides hope, guidance, resources, empowerment, and ongoing support to both the immediate and extended family members of a missing person, hosts family gatherings for families and their law enforcement team to focus on issues surrounding the ongoing search, Education provides free safety skills and abduction prevention education to children, parents, teachers, and communities. Utilizes a safe curriculum entitled Net Smarts, provided by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as well as Guardian, created for the Arkansas Department of Education to be utilized in Arkansas classrooms or as long distance learning. Legislation advocating for legislation that protects the rights of children, was instrumental in federal mandates signed by President Clinton for missing children, as well as the Megan's Law legislation in Arkansas that requires sex offender registration and notification of said registered offender. So all of this to say she came up with this plan and this foundation 
to serve other families who are missing children and going through what she is going through. Yeah. As of today, Morgan's case is still open. Her body has never been found. They don't know who took her. And I was watching the documentary and I highly recommend it to anyone who is into stuff like that. But her mom's on there. Her family's on there. And it's just really sad because she talks about like having hope that maybe Morgan is alive because she's seen other people come home after years of being abducted. But she also just doesn't know. And it's just she doesn't know. There's no closure Closure. for her because she's living with her daughter's missing. They've never found her body. They've never found anything. And every day it's like, will they? I was kind of in awe of her because she talks about how people say sometimes, how long are you going to keep looking for her? How long are you going to keep doing this? How long are you going to keep going on the news and talking about her? And she's like, however long it takes. Because if I stop, then no one's going to do it. Yeah. And I just think like, that's, why would you even ask that question? Yeah, that's pretty heartless. Like, I understand maybe somebody coming at as like wanting her to find closure, you know, like, when are you gonna let this go, leave this behind you? But there's too many unknowns. Mm -hmm. You can't expect her to walk away from it because she doesn't have answers. Yeah, that's right. So another side note that I wanted to point out, Morgan's dad was also ruled out in the investigation. There were some people who thought at the time his lack of speaking to the media was a sign that he was involved. However, he was not. He did everything he could to be helpful in the case and was not involved in her disappearance. And he even said, like, the reason he didn't talk to the media was because one time someone basically told him, we don't care what the dad has to say. We want to hear from the mom. So he was kind of like, okay, well, I'm not going to talk to you then. Well, yeah. And also like not saying something isn't an admission of guilt. No. What if he just doesn't want to? You know what I mean? Like people handle things differently. People handle grief differently. People handle trauma differently. Maybe his handling is nonverbal. Like he doesn't have to say anything. No. And he's processing that his daughter is gone and they're standing there judging him because he doesn't want to be on the news. Props to Colleen for getting her story out there and continuing to share her story and continuing to be strong and put her face out there. Yeah. But maybe he was doing everything he could to just survive. keep himself together. Yeah. Right. You have to kind of think about how hard that is. Like, you're already going through the worst thing a parent can go through. Mm -hmm. As a, a capital P parent, the worst thing you can go through, like something happening to your child. And then all of a sudden, on top of having to process and deal with that, you're being thrown in front of countless cameras. You have dozens of people asking you questions. You don't have time to handle it. Even if he wanted his own sort of closure he can't find it because people are constantly asking him about it Mm -hmm. like like you said maybe keeping quiet and keeping out of it was all he was doing to stay sane and he probably felt some kind of like i'm sure they both did some form of guilt too which is right hard enough to process so i can't imagine and that's maybe one of the things that I can see that being one of the things that keeps Colleen going is that she even said that a lot of people considered her an overprotective mother. And it was this one time that she was like, yeah, okay, go ahead and play with your friends. We know it's a safe area. And it's this one time that something terrible happened. Like, I can't imagine the guilt that you would feel. It's not her fault. And she doesn't deserve to feel guilt because the world is a terrible place. No. But I can see that probably keeping her awake at night just because it's that like, I don't know what other term other to use than survivor's guilt that like Mm -hmm. it's on me sort of thing which it's not and she says in the hulu documentary she's like yeah i didn't want to let her go but my friends were like oh it's a safe area and she was like thinking to herself that kids needed a little bit of freedom i'm like no they don't (laughs) stories like this tell me why i'm a crazy person and cannot take my eyes off of my children and will not let them go anywhere i'm constantly counting them maybe I mean, maybe true crime is not that great for me because it makes my anxiety go, like, up here. Also, I'm like, if anyone says to me, you're an overprotective parent, I'm going to say, okay, give me a piece of paper. I need to write this Hulu documentary down for you. Why don't you watch that and then come back at me? I'm sure there's many you could recommend. I just, like, start naming off cases. I'm all, Dateline, episode 23, season, (laughs) blah, 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 this person. Hulu, blah, 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 this person. And they're like, you're freaking nuts. And I'd be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Anyway. Well, the human race is 
shitty right? the human race is shitty yes and the world is not a peaceful kind place as much as we want it to be and as much as those of us in it try and make it that way there are people out there who will do terrible things to people that don't deserve it and you can't do anything other than just try to protect yourself and those around you yeah and like we said just the disappointment in the justice system and right i mean this man if he was her i mean even if he wasn't her abductor he's still a shit human but if he was her abductor he was 70 he was in his 70s i am sure his granddaughter probably was not the only victim and who knows there could have been other victims that he murdered or who had gone missing and just were never found right that's i think that's the hardest part too is like just never finding them just like yeah the unknown is really hard but never finding them it's just like they're gone yeah it is that frustrating bit like in my own mind sexual assault is like right behind murder in Mm -hmm. my own mind yeah and i don't understand legislative wise it's looked at so um it's not taken as seriously Mm -hmm. which is so crazy to me like i just i don't even have words to say like why that doesn't make sense because to me it feels like number two on the list you know but apparently it's not well and then also no sane person and the the documentary kind of opens up with this with a guard and he's saying like being sexually attracted to a child is disgusting i don't understand it and that was my thought too i was like yeah i don't get it so like you're saying murder sexual assault and sexual assault of children don't make sense at all and like they're horrible horrible things that we should take more seriously than we do yeah right those are the kind of predators you shouldn't want out on the street ever ever again regardless of if you're in their victim pool or whatever like it could be friends or family that they take from you like it could be somebody you know next time like you should want those people behind bars for forever preach jessica preach (laughs) So on that (laughs) note, Colleen said something in the Hulu documentary that like really stood out to me, especially with it being Child Abuse Awareness Month and with what you just said. She said, it's insane that we live in a world where someone can take a child and we just don't know what happened to them and we cannot find them. We cannot allow that to happen in our world. There was no part of that that's acceptable. We can change how that looks and we can change that children wouldn't be taken and communities are educated and law enforcement knows how to respond and that predators get jail sentences that don't allow them to get out again and commit these types of crimes, like you were saying. Like, Mm -hmm. we need to change the sentences for, they should fit the crime. They should. Yeah, they really should. Can I, a side note that's related that I actually... I came across something really interesting that was a story of this American couple that went to Japan and they were in Tokyo for a visit and they were on the the mass transit. They were on like their form of subway and across from them was this little girl who was probably about five or six talking to this woman and they figured they were mother and daughter and then the train stopped at a station and the little girl got off by herself and they were like, what the heck? That's that's crazy. That's really weird. And so like later on in their trip, they made friends with a local and they kind of asked about it because it, it stood out to them, right? Because that's not something that you would really ever see in America. Mm-mm. And the guy explained, the local explained that children in Japan are, they're given a certain amount of independency and relied upon to like go to the store, go to school on their own. Some of the little kids I don't know exactly the term for it, but they're given these little yellow bucket hats. And if you're in the grocery store and you see a little kid in a bucket hat, you know that they're there shopping by themselves. And like you might ask them like, hey, do you need help? Or like, do you need me to get something down off a shelf? Like that yellow bucket hat is an indicator that this child is solo. And the American asked like, how how is this like, how is this a thing? Like, how how are your children? Yeah. And he said that Japanese culture looks at children as something to be protected by the entire society. That's how it should be everywhere. Exactly. And it's the community's society to protect every child, regardless if it's your own, regardless if it's a stranger, you protect 
every child. So those little yellow hats walking down the street, if it's raining, you hand over your umbrella. If it's a little kid, regardless, like if they're wearing a yellow hat or not, if it's a kid walking across a crosswalk, you cross with them. You see them in the grocery store, you help them. You see them on the train, you sit with them because the children are the responsibility of society. Mm -hmm. And why is that something that America doesn't understand? Why is this something that is so foreign? That's like, it seems like an obvious thing. To everybody. But we are so far on the other spectrum of that, where you can't not look at your children for five minutes because you may never see them again. Yeah. And I'm not saying that no crime against children happens in Japan. I'm not saying that because people are people and people do terrible things regardless. But their society as a whole looks at every child as somebody to protect. Well, think about this. Think about all of the people we've covered who had horrible, shitty childhoods because their parents were just shit. And then they grew up to be psychopaths who killed people. And I'm not making excuses or anything, but I'm just saying like, just think about all of the things that could change potentially if we did see children that way like yeah if all of us saw children that way because right i definitely see children that way like i know lots of people who do i mean i don't even want children and i will protect a child with my life you know what i mean like yeah um you came and babies have my children and you don't even like having kids around i like your kids come on now you (laughs) say these things about me as a joke and people don't understand that they're jokes i'm sorry jessica's a really good person i just like to joke with her (laughs) you say that also about dogs and people think i'm a damn devil because i like hate dogs i don't hate dogs i just don't want one i don't hate kids i just don't want one for legal reasons that's a joke okay I don't, I don't mind kids. I just don't. No, want you them. literally <laughs> just like talked about how important it is to protect children. Yeah. I and just... that's how everybody should be raised. And maybe if we were yeah. raised that way, like it, it just would be a better place. The world would just be a better place if everybody believed that. I feel like it's so instinctual that it's been pulled out of us, right? Like even you take examples of animal families, a lot of them, I won't say most, a lot of them raise the young together. Mm -hmm. Elephants, meerkats, regardless, like it is the responsibility of the whole to raise and protect and flourish the children, Mm -hmm. the young ones. Yeah. I don't understand why we have strayed so far away from that. And as much as uh, we try very carefully not to get into big topics i think this is very topical right now Mm -hmm. because people are putting unnecessary things higher than the lives of children on a daily basis right now which is fucking bananas yeah children are dying and you literally don't care which is so crazy to me i just i don't understand how so for me whenever i see like a child who is hurting or a child who is sick or anything like that i just want to like wrap them in my arms and just like hug them and tell them it's gonna be okay and protect them and do everything i can to help them it's just so foreign to me to think that other people see them and they have completely different thoughts and it's fucking scary yeah just the complete opposite side of things it's fucking scary And the fact that they don't get enough time in prison to prevent them from hurting another child is disgusting. Yeah, it just is. It sheds light on how little certain lives are valued. So we should rethink this maybe, guys. I don't know. know. Let's let's all do better. Let's all write letters and take some action. Yeah. I mean, we all know I could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. But I feel like this month especially, I just felt like it was important to shed some light on the fact that children are not safe and they should be. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So the sources for this episode today include Still Missing Morgan on Hulu, The Crime Wire, Wikipedia, and Five News Online. Last time you had, like, if people have any information, they can call whoever. Do you have anything like that on this? I do. So you can obviously contact the Morgan Nick Foundation, and then you can contact Alma PD in Arkansas at the dispatch phone number 989-875-7505 if you have any information. Also, I've kind of glazed over it a little bit, but how cool is it that their chief started out as a dispatcher? I thought that was really cool. I was like, how many dispatchers work their way up to chief? And how many chiefs understand the dispatch world? Yeah, I bet you he talks about it. (laughs) Just the one. (laughs) And now I feel like I need to go take a three-year nap, so... (laughs) <laughs> let's turn into snails let's all turn into snails and have a three-year nap clap clap 
Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at truthliesandalibis.